Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the 16th annual Epic Inspiration Awards. My name is Kristen Tellis, and I've had the privilege to serve this year as president of the Emory Public Interest Committee. For those of you who are not familiar with EPIC, we're the student-run organization here at Emory Law that promotes an ethic of service and supports students seeking to build public interest careers. If you can't already tell, the Inspiration Awards are one of EPIC's biggest and most exciting events of the year. We come together as a community to honor three attorneys who inspire us to work harder and reach higher. This event truly celebrates the best of what the profession can be. But the Inspiration Awards serve yet another very important purpose. While we honor those who have already accomplished so much, we also seek to build for the future. All the money we raise through this event goes directly to support students doing unpaid public interest work this summer. In fact, there are many past and future EPIC grant recipients in the audience right now. I encourage all of you at the reception to speak to them and ask them about their projects, passions, and goals. I guarantee you'll see pretty quickly that your donations are being spent on a very worthy cause. So thank you for joining us tonight to honor three attorneys whose work has touched so many of us. EPIC is honored to host this event, but we recognize that none of this would be possible without your extraordinary support and donations. So now with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dean Robert Shapiro to offer a few words of welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> well, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Tonight, we celebrate our commitment to public interest as we honor three exemplary public servants and two students destined, we know, for leadership in the public interest. Promoting the public interest is central to the legal profession and to the mission of Emory Law School. At Emory, we seek to promote the rule of law at home and abroad, and we highlight the responsibility of all lawyers to serve the public interest. From the first day of law school, we emphasize that a commitment to public interest should be part of every lawyer's professional identity. At Emory, we promote public interest law in many ways, including our clinics and field placements, our pro bono program, the loan repayment assistance program, which provides financial help to our new graduates in public sector careers and assisted 24 graduates this past year, the public interest dinner series, in which a group of first-year students meets with local public interest lawyers throughout the year. And later this month, we will host a public sector career fair where more than 85 local public sector employers will interview students for summer internships. I also want to share some news updates about the recent public interest accomplishments of our students who continue to make us very proud. Last year, five of our new graduates were selected for prestigious public interest fellowships, sponsored by Equal Justice Works, Hunton and Williams, Law Students for Reproductive Justice, and Loyola Law School. Now, a current student also had an especially remarkable public interest experience. Though public interest work is immensely satisfying, it can require sacrifice. Often, that sacrifice is financial, but not always. As many of you know, our student Ilan Grappel traveled to Egypt last summer to, a turn, to intern for St. Andrew's Refugee Services. He ended up being detained in Egypt for four and a half months until he was freed as part of a prisoner exchange with Israel. So I'd like you to please join with me in celebrating Elan's return to the law school community. So, right. okay. yeah. Thank you. Of course, at the heart of Emory's public interest law program is the Emory Public Interest Committee EPIC the student group that has created this very special evening. I honor them for their remarkable achievements and salute and thank all of you 
for your commitment to support public service. We are very grateful indeed. Now, I'd like to introduce Judge Dorothy Toth Beasley, who will preside over this evening's ceremonies. Judge Beasley has had a distinguished public service career. In addition to serving on the State Court of Fulton County for seven years and the Georgia Court of Appeals for 14 years, Judge Beasley has had significant international involvement. She taught judicial seminars in Albania and advised them on their new constitution. She helped train judges in the Republic of Georgia, the other Georgia. Uh, she worked for the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And she earned a Master of Laws degree in international law here at Emory in 2008. Active in the community, Judge Beasley is a co-founder of Atlanta's Table, which collects and redistributes otherwise unused table-ready food from restaurants and caterers. She serves on the task force against commercial sexual exploitation of children at Lutheran Church of the Redeemer. And of course, one of the favorite groups she supports is EPIC, on whose advisory board she serves. So Judge Beasley, thank you for presiding over our ceremonies this evening. Please join me in welcoming Judge Beasley. You can tell I'm old, I've got to wear these now, see? So, hello everybody. We're here for a celebration, and before we get to the celebration for which we're gathered, I'd like to share with you and call your attention to another celebration. Today is the 100th anniversary of Charles Dickens' birth. And this fits right into our celebration because he cru crusaded for social justice through his novels and also through his life. One of his finest novels is Bleak House, which was published in series in 1852 and 1853. And at the novel's core is a long running litigation in England's Court of Chancery. What was the case? Yes, Jarndyce versus John Jarndyce, which uh, concerned the fate of a very large inheritance. The litigation consumed years and the cost of the lawsuit consumed the entire inheritance. That was emblematic of the failure of chancery. So Dickens' assault in Bleak House on the flaws of the, the British judiciary system was based in part on his own experiences as a law clerk, so you don't know what you're gonna find when you go out and be a law clerk. And in his part is his experiences in chancery seeking to enforce his copyright on his earlier books. The novel actually helped to spur an ongoing movement that culminated in the enactment of legal reform in the 1870s in England. So he too was a public servant in the law. Our leading lights tonight being celebrated here and the EPIC students who serve via EPIC grants in summertime can, unlike the litigants in Dickens' time, access the courts and use the law to effect public good. So we move then to our celebration tonight, honoring and supporting the work of those who have committed themselves to the calling, the calling of legal service in the public good. As well put by EPIC's advisory person from the faculty, Sue McAvoy, where are you? They have to know who you are. Stand up please, Sue. Well, she needs to well, <clears throat> and I quote her, she said, we honor those who have not sought prestige, we applaud those who have not demanded a claim, and we offer gratitude to those who have not asked for thanks. Tonight we celebrate the service that has been done, that is being done, and that will be carried forward by those who are honored and by the students here tonight. The notion that working for the public good is essential to the legal profession, that practicing law at its most basic level is about service is not new, of course. Actually, a couple of years ago, 
I participated in Houston in the training of young associates in Greenberg Traurig Law Firm. And we used one of the courtrooms in the Harris County Courthouse for the mock trial. On the door of the courtroom, the judge had placed a lawyer's creed. At the end of that creed, the lawyers entering the courtroom, it states, to the public and our systems of justice, I offer service. I will strive to improve the law and our legal system, to make the law and our legal system available to all, and to seek the common good through the representation of my clients. So public service has always been a part of the lawyer's calling, even in Texas. Actually, we seem to be in the midst of a blossoming of idealism and commitment to the public service here among our students. I say our students, I'm really one of them. The work of EPIC is an expression of that commitment, but EPIC could not be here today without the extraordinary examples of people such as the legal professionals that we honor tonight, nor without the commitment of public service exhibited by all of you. You're being, just being here tonight demonstrates your interest in this and your commitment to it. So thanks to everyone who has supported EPIC's work and will continue to do so. Now, we start with a surprise. In fact, we had a little discussion about whether this was a surprise or not. It will be a surprise to anyone that's not part of the faculty or the student body here, and I know there are a lot of you out there. We are pleased to honor two graduating law students who, with extraordinary effort above and beyond, do work to serve the public good. Presenting these awards is Professor Julie Seaman. Julie? Good evening. It gives me great pleasure to present the outstanding 3L commitment, I don't need these actually, to public service awards. These awards are bestowed upon the students who have exemplified the greatest commitment to public service through their work at Emory Law School. Nominations are received from students, faculty, and staff. A committee of faculty then reviews these nominations and selects the recipients. I'm pleased to present to you the two extremely deserving winners of the 2012, 2012, I think I'm supposed to say, Outstanding 3L Commitment to Public Service Award, Molly Palmer and Kristen Tullis. Come on up. I'm not going to give them to you yet. <laughs> Molly and Kristen. Before I say a few words about each of you, I just want to say that I've had the pleasure of having Kristen and Molly each in three different courses that I've taught. And, um, and I have to say that these are the sorts of students that make what, what we do on the faculty just so rewarding and indeed inspiring. So thank you for teaching me. Um, so Molly, you've been sensitive to the plight of the underserved for many years now. Before your arrival at Emory Law School, you were a compassionate teacher to special needs students, both here in our Atlanta public schools and in Clark County in Athens. The passion, this passion, move up so I can talk to you, <laughs> intersected with the law when you interned with the Georgia Innocence Project and found your calling in indigent criminal defense work. Since that time, you've become a campus leader in your field. You've led the Know Your Rights program, organizing and training scores of Emory students to teach youth in middle school, high school, and shelters about how to interact with law enforcement officials. You've created a vibrant criminal law society that is crafting an eyewitness identification symposium to be held later this semester. And you've led by example by interning at the DeKalb County Public Defender's Office and working with the Barton Juvenile Defender Clinic here at the law school, serving as a student attorney and as an intern with the Appeal for Youth Project. Wow, how have you done all these things? <laughs> <laughs> Providing holistic appellate representation of youthful offenders in the criminal justice system. You've also supported public interest more broadly by serving EPIC as co-chair of this year's Inspiration Awards. 
Molly, it gives me great pleasure to present you with the Outstanding Commitment to Public Service Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Kristen. Kristen. <laughs> Kristen, one of your classmates has called you a driving force behind public interest at the law school. And in fact, just a few minutes ago when I was in the seminar that I teach, which Molly um, had to leave early. Um, <laughs> so after she left, we were talking about the awards and one of the students said, oh, Kristen's getting one? She's so awesome. <laughs> You have a strong interest in poverty law and access to housing, which spurred you to co-chair the 2010 EPIC conference about poverty law in Atlanta. You then spent a summer in Washington working with the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty and worked with Professor Frank Alexander on assisting Joplin, Missouri property owners who were devastated by tornado damage. Locally, you have volunteered with the Georgia Law Center for the Homeless here in Atlanta and currently intern with the Atlanta Legal Aid Society. But your crowning achievement has been serving as this year's EPIC president, where you have worked tirelessly to not only support EPIC's traditionally ambitious array of programs, but to advocate for public interest students with the law school administration and build relationships outside the law school community as well. Kristen, it gives me great pleasure to present you with the 2012 Outstanding Commitment to Public Service Award. Congratulations. There's nothing in my notes that says we can't give those students a, a standing ovation. <laughs> and that's just the beginning. <clears throat> the first Epic Inspiration Award of the evening is for unsung devotion to those most in need. It will be presented by Tally Wells, who has worked at Atlanta Legal Aid Society now since 2000. And since 2009, he directed the Mental Health and Disability Rights Project. Tally is a community activist, serving as government relations chair for Friends of, now it says pronounce this like Marsh, so it's Larsh. <clears throat> You'll have to tell us what that is. And on the boards of the Center for Working Families and also the Behavioral Health Coalition. Mr. Wells received Emory University's Martin Luther King Community Service Award in 2009 and was honored as Humanitarian of the Year by, Emory Univers by the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network in 2010. So please welcome Tally Wells. Okay. <laughs> I have always thought that the Emory Epic Award was the ultimate award for a public interest lawyer, and it is a true honor to present an Epic Award for unsung devotion to those most in need to Sue Jameson. But it is also a fun award for me to present to Sue, because Sue wants to be unsung. She gets mad at me. We were at, uh, with a, a, a muckety-muck at Health and Human Services a few days ago, and she was very clear and a little bit angry that I would try to sing her praises in front of this person, and she said not to do it. So. Um, I am very excited for the opportunity to make Sue mad right now um, because nobody deserves an epic award as much as Sue does. And Sue is the quintessential legal services attorney. She is not a Thurgood Marshall, even though the 
U.S. Supreme Court case that she led has been often described as the Brown v. Board of Education for people with disabilities because it is having a tectonic, a seismic transformation in this state and in this country for people with disabilities and for all of our communities because what it says is that people with disabilities have the right not to receive services and supports in institutions but to live in the community in the most integrated setting. And that case grew out of her quintessential legal services work where day to day in the 1980s, day to day in the 1990s, day to day in whatever you call the 2000s, she went to work to represent and to give a voice to those who did not have a voice, not only in the legal community, but those who did not have a voice, even at legal services. When she went to Florida Legal Services and when she came to Atlanta Legal Aid, there was nobody going into the psychiatric hospitals and representing people in the psychiatric hospitals who had been deemed unworthy of being a part of the community, who had basically been left there to rot. And she would go day to day into those psychiatric hospitals, represent these men and women, and befriend these men and women and do what we are all as lawyers called to do, which is to be their voice, to be their advocate, and most importantly probably is what she does of empowering them to have a voice and to be a client that really does make decisions about their, their own lives. And Lois Curtis, who is here today, was the plaintiff in the Olmstead case. She had been in and out of Georgia Regional Hospital, um, particularly uh, the one over off Candler Road over 30 times. It was basically a revolving door where she had again and again and again been left to, to not have much of an existence. And Sue represented her. Sue gave her a voice. And one in a 10 million, one in a 100 million case goes to the US Supreme Court. But due to Sue's representation and because she inflamed lots of other lawyers around her at the Atlanta Legal Aid Society, at the Sutherland Law Firm, and in many other places. She got a whole band of people to work with her to bring this case all the way to U.S. Supreme Court. And Lois has not been in an institution since then, since really while the case was going on. She, in June, was welcomed by a guy named President Barack Obama in the White House where she presented one of her paintings because she is a very, very good artist. And she has been living a life of meaning. And there are thousands of people in our community, in our country, who are doing that because of the Olmstead decision, because of the quintessential legal services work that Sue has done. But we are only at the beginning. And so join me in congratulating Sue Jamison for the unsung devotion to those most in need award. Tally, where are you? Anyone who knows you, and many here tonight do, knows that you are a great guy in many ways, but I'm going to stress generous spirit because that is what it took to take the time to summarize all the details for the epic board and to come here tonight and say such generous things. Let me just say that to the extent this award is about being unsung, that is no longer true. In any case, instead of trying to respond, I'll use this chance to say thank you to Tally for bringing your endless talent and energy to disability work. And thank you to Judge Beasley, Dean Shapiro, the EPIC Student Board, the Advisory Board, to Sue McAvoy, and everyone at Emory who promotes and supports public interest law. 
And now I want to try a general thank you. If I've learned anything in a public interest career, it is that every step forward is a joint effort. So I'll mention the categories, because if I even tried to mention the people, it'd be a ridiculously long list, to remind you and to remind myself that legal advocacy is an exercise in dependence on others on people who work in the nonprofit world, people who work in the service provider world, people who work for the state and the nursing home industry, people of every job description in the legal advocacy organizations, and my supportive family and friends. I think there are probably folks in all those categories here, and I wish there were a way to thank every single person who has shared my frustration my failures, and my happy endings. So I've saved the most important thank you for uh, my clients. I'll begin this part with a little of my own history. I had no exposure in my life to institutions other than staring at a frightening, barred, windowed place, which was a state hospital in Trenton, New Jersey, where I grew up. My decision to advocate for and with people and institutions resulted from the shock I felt many years later when I entered Northeast Florida State Hospital. I saw that day for the first time the despair of so many human beings caged together in a day room, the baggy clothes, the torn sneakers, the dazed, exhausted faces. And for some reason, it was that shock that shifted my thinking about what I should be doing. The people who have survived in those places and shared with me the details of their struggles, there are no words to describe the rich gifts of courage and wisdom that each one of them has given me. So I was not really sure what would be helpful to say in a few minutes tonight Luckily, I had a chance to ask a few law students recently at the public, Emory Public Interest Law reception. Andrea Wood said, tell us a story about how a client has been affected by your work. Molly Palmer and Jamie Schickler both said, tell us a little about the Olmstead case. And others suggested that I explain what has kept me interested in this work for so long which frankly, from a law student's point of view, is perhaps a polite way to say, how can anyone be as old as you are <laughs> and still be doing the same thing? So I'll try to follow these suggestions. One, I'll start with the last request. What has kept me going is the same thing that motivated me in the first place. I think that law is a powerful tool in the struggle for human dignity and the empowerment of the oppressed. I decided to try to try to focus on how to use law as a tool in this struggle. And that simple idea was my initial in, uh, motivation and it is still my motivation. Here are two more thoughts about how I've made it so long in public interest work. One, hey Lois, how you doing? Okay. One, um, public interest law can be a very flexible sort of career. For example, at one point in a Florida Legal Services program, I was doing domestic relations cases most of the time. And after a while, I really didn't like that work. When I decided I wanted to do just institutional advocacy, I volunteered at Atlanta Legal Aid. And our enlightened director, Steve Gottlieb, eventually hired me. The fact is that the problems of inequity in our society are so vast that in any area of advocacy that may become your passion, you will find that clients have new problems every day even when you think you've seen it all. And many of these problems would justify a whole advocacy project by itself. Secondly, something I know that has kept me going more than any other single factor, and it's a tribute to Atlanta Legal Aid and other public interest law efforts. For the most part in this world, 
If it is working right, you will be in a supportive, creative, collaborative workplace. And to me, that's a very, very important thing. Now, since I mentioned the shock that gave rise to my own interest and passion, which was unexpected, really, I want to come back to that, how I felt when I saw the caged people in the state hospital in Florida. I think that's an experience that we all have, a moment when we think, this is so sad, this is so inexcusable. And I think most of us, when the conditions are right, we try to respond. If the outrage and the sorrow <clears throat> that we feel, <clears throat> excuse me, can be channeled into legal advocacy, great. But I know the next question, how do I find a way to get paid? How can I get paid to do work that will enable me to use law <clears throat> on the side of those whose legal rights are so blatantly overlooked. I think that many students and attorneys at all stages of their career struggle with this. My own daughter struggles with this. So perhaps I will sound naive, a wishful thinker, but I hope it is still true that where there is a will, a beginning of a vision of how we might even the scales of justice a bit, then there is eventually a way. And now I'll try to combine a few words about the Olmstead case and a client story. I choose Mr. A's story tonight because he was one of my first clients and his story, like many of the stories from those days, is also the story of why we eventually went to federal court for Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson in 1995. We've already acknowledged Lois but I just want you to know that her whole supportive community is here with her, and I would like to honor them, for they've created a community for Lois and an art uh, career, which is remarkable. Anyway, when I met Mr. A, he was 18. He was a cheerful survivor. A sense of, he had a sense of humor. He'd been at Georgia Regional Hospital Atlanta for most of his life since he was placed there as a child of 12 by uh, the state. He was a ward of the state. His facts were typical of people in the 80s who were essentially destined to spend their lives in state institutions. He had very little education, many aggressive incidents, a victim of serious child abuse, and no family, and absolutely no voice. In fact, he was not skilled at playing the game of convincing a judge to let him out of there. For example, he would say, don't worry, Miss Sue. If the judge doesn't let me out, I'll tell him to watch out because I have the devil power. <laughs> and he would kind of look at you conspiratorially and you would hope, oh my God, I hope he never does say that. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I remember clearly after more than 20 years is that he would ask a simple question over and over. Could you please get me out of here before my birthday? After a year, many struggles, a variety of legal strategies, we finally did secure his release through a probate court shortly before his birthday. And for a few years, I went to his birthday party in a group home. Max, my husband who's here tonight, and my most loyal supporter, also remembers going to Mr. A's birthday parties. <laughs> Mr. A got reconnected with his brother, liked his home, his yard, his provider, and never went back to an institution. So in 1995, after years of trying to use various provisions of state law to convince judges and state officials to release people, Lois and Elaine filed their case in federal court. Like Mr. A, 10 years before, both plaintiffs had been in state hospitals most of their lives. The Georgia Assistant Attorney General took the position that the state could decide whether they chose to provide services to people in segregated settings, institutional settings, or community settings. And I remember at oral argument Justice Ginsburg asking if that would be true for other state and governmental facilities, such as, for example, libraries. Justice Ginsburg asked the Attorney General, would it be okay if 
As long if, if all people with disabilities in libraries had to go sit in a very special room where they were segregated from everybody else, as long as you provided them with books, which is when we thought things might be going our way. <laughs> <laughs> and the Supreme Court concluded in 1999 that based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, the state may not, in fact, confine people in institutions who could live in the community. The case has its legalistic and its vague characteristics, and I won't go into that tonight, but it has been a strong enough decision to result in increasingly favorable lower court decisions and to serve as a basis for successful efforts by the Department of Justice to, under the current administration, to bring states into compliance. What has happened since, I'll say three quick things. One, the great civil right for integration of people with disabilities has not trickled down to the individuals that we encounter in state hospitals and nursing homes. Unlike the civil rights movement for people of color, most institutionalized people do not know that they have a civil right to integrated alternatives. Number two, for people in nursing homes, people at risk of institutionalization, such as homeless mentally ill people, including people on waiting lists and people trapped in the state hospital forensic system, the integration mandate, which is a civil right under the ADA, ADA interpreted by the United States Supreme Court, is barely on the horizon. And number three, on the other hand, as Tally was pointing out, there has been a substantial shift away from state hospitals to community and a significant improvement in community alternative services in Georgia. A powerful symbol, by the way, is the lovely flat green meadow that has recently replaced the children's unit and the forensic unit, which I remember, on the grounds of the former Georgia Mental Health Institute on Briarcliff Road, and it is now Emory's Briarcliff campus. Woo <laughs> um, so when I think about how many lives are still limited by the way we segregate people with disabilities, I'm so happy that people at Legal Aid are still committed, are continuing to be committed to disability integration work. Uh, we have new leadership, new energy, new creativity. We're more collaborative and have more long range thinking uh, about reform and change. Tally Wells is our leader our leader in knowledge and everything, uh, a master of organization, is our paralegal manager, Tony Pastore, who is here somewhere. Catherine Werewill has dedicated five years uh, to our work as a compassionate intake paralegal. Susan Walker Goyko is our returning attorney star from our early days. Jessica Felfoldi is an Emory Law graduate and our Equal Justice Fellow a winner of several awards already for her commitment to public interest. And Paula Miller is our unflappable, talented social worker. Also, we work closely with the Georgia Advocacy Office under the leadership of Ruby Moore and their fight to the finish institution-based advocates, Tamika Jackson, Ernest Holston, and Jerry Speed. I know it is dangerous to mention names because there are so many in this struggle, but I did mention these because with all the many important disability issues, we are trying to keep an eye on the ADA's right to integration of institutionalized persons. We want the shift toward a new system in Georgia to clearly and enthusiastically recognize that integration is a civil right and not a waiting list or an empty promise. So in closing, I need to mention once again the people who made this award possible for me because they are confined in psychiatric hospitals and nursing homes and they can't be here. Anyone, and there are many in this room, who has seen their powerlessness and their strength, those crowded behind institutional walls and those who have found their way out, changed out of those baggy clothes, we know that these individuals are truly the unsung heroes. Thank you. Thank you.
Isn't it remarkable what a lawyer can do with words and a heart? No shovels, no caterpillars, and she can move mountains. That's remarkable. Presenting the award for the outstanding leadership in the public interest is Jessica Falfoldi, who graduated from Emory Law School just last May. She serves now as an Equal Justice Works Fellow with the Atlanta Legal Aid Society, as Sue said, in the Mental Health and Disability Rights Project. As a law student, Jessica reached out beyond her classes to intern with the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation and the Barton Juvenile Defender Clinic and the Atlanta Legal Aid Society and Tapestry and the Barton Child Law and Policy Center. She also served on the EPIC board. So she was a busy young lady and will be that, I think, forever. <laughs> Jessica received the 2011 James Elliott Community Service Award from the law school and the 2011 Humanitarian Award from the university. Please welcome Jessica Falfoldi. There you are, I couldn't find you. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. All right. I'm very honored to introduce the recipient of the Outstanding Leadership in the Public Interest Award, my very dear friend, Professor Jan Pratt. And I say introduce, but really, as she is dear to many of us here, I suppose I will instead happily refresh your recollection of her many contributions, her loyalty, and her steadfast leadership. While I feel especially lucky to have gotten to know Jan through my work with her, both on the Public Interest Advisory Board as her student coordinator and uh, through the Public Interest Dinner Series, I do not believe I'm singular in my connection with her. She has touched countless other attorneys and shaped their career paths through her student-centered public interest initiatives here at Emory. And she's also impacted our greater community here in Atlanta through her many um, community works, both as a mediator and as um, a member of the, uh, of the review board for the DeKalb uh, Juvenile Court. So truly, she's been an outstanding leader in the public interest here. She's formed many programs, a few of which I'll, I'll hit on in my introduction. She steered these programs many for decades. And with the true mark of a great leader, she has welcomed and cultivated other leaders to take the helm when the time was right. And I think one of the foremost examples of that sort of leadership is the Barton Center. Um, Professor Pratt founded the Summer Child Advocacy Program uh, back in 1992. And that program was the germinating seed of the Barton Center. Um, as many of you know, the Barton Center is now a nationally recognized think tank for child law, an advocacy center that has changed law, changed policies, introduced hundreds of students to work in the public interest, to advocacy, and has made the lives better for hundreds and thousands of court-involved children here in Georgia. And that sort of forethought, that sort of initiative that germinated that seed of the Summer Child Advocacy Program, brought life to the Barton Center and all it is able to accomplish now. Jan has also led our fine field placement program here at Emory for nigh on 21 years. I say has, she's retired, but had led. Um, the field placement program, as you may know, provides invaluable practice experience for students through a variety of legal externships. And many, if not most, of these externships are public interest and government field oriented. Um, through her steadfast guidance, this program has impacted hundreds of students who've had the chance to work with real clients, work on real legal issues, and experience firsthand public interest law. John Lant, Jan launched and has been co-director of the professionalism program here at Emory for over a decade. Um, I believe it's unique amongst the other professionalism programs here in the state. Uh, it was unique in its early start and also in its approach. 
Um, it brings to light early in a student's career the importance of the professional, of considering the professional quandaries she might face. And more importantly, it helps build those values and the judgment that are required to befit a true professional in our, uh, in our work. I think this program also highlights her leadership qualities as what better mark is there of a leader than one who exhibits the highest values of professionalism and also imprints those values on the generations to come. Finally, one of the initiatives for which I know she is most proud is the pro bono program, which she led for the past five years. This is a program which encourages and facilitates, encourages and facilitates pro bono uh, participation by our students here. Uh, it celebrates those students who participate, and it, more importantly, highlights and encourages students to recognize their professional obligation to provide legal services to those who otherwise do not have equal access to the law. And I think that's why all of us are here tonight, because we most value equal access to the law. And I believe a common thread in all these initiatives and in these leadership qualities is that she has helped to provide, to facilitate, to initiate multitudes of opportunities for students to have exposure to real clients, real issues, pressing matters, whether through pro bono work, through clinical work, field placements, interacting with real professionals, talking about potential uh, nuances of professional judgment. And that has kindled the fire in so many of us here tonight for public interest work, these experiences and exposure to real clients and real issues. And for others, it's made a no less important impact by shining a light on our professional obligations to support and provide pro bono assistance to those without access to the legal system. So thanks to her long toiling, her tenacity, her forethought, her leadership, we alums and students have had the good fortune to benefit from all of these programs that she cultivated and created. So it's with heartfelt gratitude that we recognize Jan for her outstanding leadership in the public interest. Please join me in thunderous applause as we welcome her to the stage. you uh, don't know that I was not born in this country. I was born in Lancashire, uh, a, the part of England that none of you ever visit. It's between, uh, you know, you go to London and you pass through Lancashire on your way to Scotland. And there's an old Lancashire word, and the word is gobsmacked. When Dean Shapiro said I had been uh, given this incredible honor from Epic, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> you know, I feel very much like a fraud standing here. I can't tell you about people that I have gotten out of jail. I can't tell you about people who I've gotten out of institutions. Um, I can only tell you about working with Emory Law students. Um, I have been probably to every Epic uh, celebration since it got started. And that I should be following in the footsteps of people like Steve Gottlieb and Debbie Siegel and Amy Maxwell, that I should share the stage with Sue Jameson and Norman Underwood is just, just overwhelming. So forgive me if I'm a little nervous. I have stood on this stage many times over the last 30 years. I've stood here for two, on, really on two main occasions. One is visiting day, and that's when I stand here and tell people why they should come to Emory Law School. And the other day, the other day is orientation, when I stand here and say, this is why you came to Emory Law School. So I thought I would take a minute today to say, why have I been here at Emory Law School? Um, 
I want to thank, of course, the EPIC board and Dean Shapiro. I want to recognize my members of my family that are here, my daughter, my sister-in-law, and most importantly, the best mother-in-law that anybody ever has had. Dorothy Prant is just a wonderful person. I want to particularly recognize her because she came a long way to be here today. So over the years, I've known a lot of students. And many students come here, they know they want to be involved in public interest organizations. They join EPIC, they lead organizations like the Homeless Advocacy Organization, they apply for EPIC grants, they hope to get Equal Justice Works uh, fellowships when they graduate. They're students like Jessica. Jessica is a wonderful example of those students who knew from the beginning what they needed and where they wanted to go. But every colleague of mine here in the law school will know that I've always worried about the others. I've always looked for the lost sheep. What, are, what about the other students? What about the ones that don't join EPIC? What about the ones that don't become involved in public interest activities here? What about them? Um, when students apply to Emory, they write an essay. And, you know, a few of them are going to say, I want to go to law school because my mother or my father's a lawyer and I want to follow them. A few of them are going to say I'm interested in law and policy. But the vast majority, now I haven't done an exhaustive survey, so no, this isn't the site. But my sense is that most of them say I'm interested in justice. I want to help people. Now, they could be just saying that. but. I want to believe that they're not just saying that, and that what my job has been over the years is to find ways for them to kind of get involved and to find a time during the years that they are here to seek justice and to do good, to be there for somebody else. I understand the stress of legal education, and I know how expensive it is, and I know what a tough job market it is. But every student who gets an Emory degree has a remarkable opportunity to really make the difference in the life of another. You heard tonight about how Sue Jameson has made the difference in the lives of so many, so many people. I would say that the privilege of getting a law degree includes the obligation to serve. That that's what lawyers do. So I would say to every law student, help one person, just one. You don't have to dedicate your life as Sue has done and others that have gotten these awards in the past have done to working with legal aid. Just help one person. Is there a family living with a substand in a substandard housing with no heat and a leaky roof? You can help that person. Is there somebody who is a victim of domestic violence who is trying to get away from their abuser with their children to a safe place? You can help them. Is there a grandmother who is trying to adopt a child whose mother is crack addicted? You can help that person. Is there a low-income community where uh, a waste management corporation is going to put a toxic dump right next to the elementary school that all their children go to? Lawyers can help those people. You can help those people. What a difference you can make. So I ask every student what I ask myself. What can I do? What will I do? I like to think that I've occasionally been successful in convincing a student to work on a case, or at least I've provided opportunities for service. Perhaps a student has found a field placement with legal aid or with uh, the DeKalb Public Defender, an eye-opening and maybe life-changing experience. I wasn't going to mention her by name, but Molly Palmer is one of those students. <laughs> Perhaps a student has worked on a habeas corpus brief so that somebody who wasn't going to be represented 
got representation. I celebrate those students. Those are the ones that really make us proud because they helped one person. Everybody can help one person. I recently became familiar with the writings of a man called Wendell Berry. I don't know if anybody else knows who this is. He's an author, he's a poet, a lifelong Baptist. He's an environmentalist and a pioneer of sustainable agriculture. Somebody said of him that his fundamental concern is for working out a basis for living a principled life. One quote of Wendell Berry I particularly like, and uh, you know, forgive me, rats and roaches live by competition under the laws of supply and demand. It is the privilege of human beings to live under the laws of justice and mercy. Barry is a farmer by avocation. He draws on that experience. And I ran across this little short story that seemed relevant today. He said, I go by a field where once I cultivated a, a few poor crops. It's now covered with young trees. I think of all the effort I wasted and all the time and how much joy I took in that failed work and how much it taught me. For in so failing, I learned something of my place, something of myself, and now I see the trees and celebrate them and welcome them back. Sometimes our efforts bear fruit immediately. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they bear fruit years from now when we don't actually see them bear fruit. Sometimes you get a completely different result from the one that you hope to get. But I like to think that at the end of the day, every Emory lawyer will embrace the responsibility of service in some small, some way, large or small. And that perhaps over the last 30 years, I've played a small part in that. In any event, I have to say, I will have tried. In December, our community lost a passionate advocate for justice with the passing of our friend, David Biederman. Many of you students, many of you gra graduates would have had Professor Biederman. He was a shining example of the very best of the legal profession, and I want to celebrate him today. He is sorely, sorely missed. On his, at his memorial service, there was a verse of scripture printed on the program, and it, it was the verse, as I told Laurie Cuzzy, his uh, widow, is the one that I was going to end with today. So let me quote this to you, because it's how I've tried to live. It's from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? That's always been my goal. Thank you. Jan was always out there beating the bushes for the students. And soon after I got on the Court of Appeals, she found her way over there to Capitol Hill. And she came into my office and she said, Dorothy, what you need is an Emory intern. <laughs> that semester, she sent me one, and I had one every semester thereafter. So if you read any opinions that I wrote, you know where the work was done. <laughs> Thanks to Jan. And don't you wish you could win the lottery and give it to all these students that want to do public service work and can't get paid for it? So please, if you do, the lottery <laughs> will take it right here. The Honorable Leah Ward Sears will present the Lifetime Commitment to Public Service Award. 
I don't like using the word lifetime. Let's say so far. <laughs> a, a graduate of Emory Law School, Justice Sears has a career characterized as a series of significant firsts. She's the first African-American female chief justice of any state's highest appellate court in the whole United States. She's the first woman and youngest person to serve as a Fulton County Superior Court judge. She then became the first woman and youngest person ever on the Supreme Court of Georgia when appointed by then Governor Zell Miller. Justice Sears spearheaded innovative programs such as the Supreme Court's Commission on Children, Family, and Marriage Law, as well as the Committee on Civil Justice. That committee develops, coordinates, and supports policy initiatives to expand the access to the courts, which of course Charles Dickens was concerned with, for low-income Georgia residents. Justice Sears was the founder and first president of the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys. She now serves on Emory University's Board of Trustees and is a partner in Schiff Hardin Law Firm. She has received countless awards for her enduring and selfless service to her community and her profession. Two especially notable ones are her selection as one of the, quote, 100 most influential people in Georgia, and another one as one of the 500 leading justices and judges in America. Please join me in welcoming Justice Leah Ward Sears. Well, good evening, everyone. It's, it's a, my pleasure to be here. I, too, want to personally welcome all of you for attending the 16th Annual Epic Inspiration Awards Ceremony. It's always good to come home to my alma mater, even though it just keeps shifting and changing and I can barely find my way here What with the, all of the new construction going on. But it's also my distinct privilege to be here with you tonight to celebrate the accomplishments of so many deserving individuals, one in particular who I owe a, a great debt of gratitude to. Norman Underwood has dedicated 45 years of his career to the legal profession and to public service. The native son of Red Bud in North Georgia Norman began his public career in 1975 and, among many notable posts, served as chair of the Judicial Nominating Committee under my governor, Zell Miller, from 1991 to 1999. I was only 36 years old when I had the audacity to throw my hat into the ring for the vacant position on the Georgia Supreme Court in 1992. And it was in part because of Norman's vision and leadership that I was, in fact, appointed to the Supreme Court that year, making me the first woman on that court. In fact, the entire judiciary in the state of Georgia began to undertake a dramatic change, and it's no coincidence that this transformation took place during Norman's tenure. Now, as you know, one of the goals of the EPIC program here at Emory is to provide internships for law students to introduce them to public service. For many, like Norman Underwood, that internship is the very first step toward a much larger commitment to public service. As he will readily tell you, Norman's interest in public service and politics came directly from his experience as a student intern in the office of Senator Richard Russell. Now, as I understand it, Norman grew up on a farm community. In high school, he won a National 4-H Club forestry competition and received a scholarship to study forestry at the University of Georgia. But following his freshman year there, he was invited by Senator Russell 
to spend his sophomore year in Washington, D.C., working as an intern in the United States Senate and attending George Washington University. And so began his love of public service and politics. After the internship, he returned to Georgia and to the University of Georgia, and that's where he graduated from the law school. During those years, he also met and married his late wife, Linda, who, as many of you know, was his cheerleader for 43 years and was herself very active in community service. At the same time that Norman was finishing law school, Governor Carl Sanders was completing his term as governor and starting his law practice in Atlanta. A faculty friend at the law school recommended to Governor Sanders that he interview Norman Underwood, who was the first recruit for the firm, which of course evolved into the international law firm of Troutman Sanders, where Norman is now senior counsel. Norman's full-time public service work began in 1997 when he left the Sanders firm to become Governor George Busby's chief of staff. He then was appointed to the Georgia Court of Appeals, but after only a year on that court, he left to pursue what he now calls his exciting but unsuccessful political adventure as a candidate for statewide office. Following those political adventures, he rejoined Troutman Sanders, where he served the firm in many, many leadership roles. Even with a busy private practice, Norman developed a reputation as a go-to speechwriter and advisor for people running for and serving in public office, people like myself. Norman served the state of Georgia in many capabilities, including as a special assistant attorney general, as well as lead outside counsel to the Georgia Lottery Corporation, which he guided through a number of legal challenges during its formation in the first decade. His legal guidance helped the Georgia Lottery became one of the nation's most successful lotteries in providing scholarships and other support for higher education and other things. Norman also chaired the board of the nonprofit Visiting Nurse Hospice Atlanta and has been a longtime elder of the North Avenue Presbyterian Church. Norman's recent public service also included serving as special monitor and advisor to the Fulton County Elections Office after that office encountered certain operational problems in conducting the general election of 2008. Tonight, however, we primarily salute Norman Underwood's role in working with Governor Zell Miller on the Judicial nomination, Nominating Commission. When Governor Miller appointed Norman to lead that commission, the governor said publicly that it would be an important job, and he wanted someone with both judicial and political experience to do it. Because of the recommendations made by the commission under Norman's eight-year leadership, the governor's judicial appointments changed our judiciary from a system with very limited gender and racial diversity into a much more inclusive and diverse body of jurists. More specifically, almost half of the trial court appointments made by Governor Zell Miller were to minority or female jurists. And those appointments more than tripled the overall percentage of women and minorities serving on the bench in this state. I was honored to have been the first of five Zell Miller appointments to the Supreme Court of Georgia, and further honored, as I said, to be his first woman. I was often asked at judicial conferences that I attended around the country how Georgia, a conservative state in the Deep South, achieved such diversity, achieved the kind of diversity as we had in our state judiciary. I mean, I really took it hard when I was the Chief Justice and no one could believe that I came from the state of Georgia, really. <laughs> But one important answer to that question is the hard work of Norman Underwood and Governor Miller's respect 
for the recommendations made by the nominating commission under his leadership. I am personally eternally grateful for not only Norman's faith in my capabilities to serve as a judge, even when I wondered about them myself, but also for his service to this state and for the contributions that really move this state light years ahead. So I am honored to present the 2012 Epic Award for Lifetime Commitment at this point to, <laughs> to public service to my friend, Norman Underwood. I really do appreciate uh, Judge Beasley and the former Chief Justice adjudicating that my award is so far rather than the end of the line. It reminds me of, I think it was either Groucho Marx or Strom Thurmond who said that uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you hang around long enough, people will remember good things you did, whether you really did them or not. <laughs> It's a special honor to participate in a program that has two real history makers of our judicial system. Thank you, Justice Sears, for those kind comments, for all that you have meant to the Georgia Supreme Court. And thank you, Judge Beasley, for presiding tonight and for all that you've done for the Court of Appeals and for the state of Georgia. And thank all of you for supporting epic internships. I was lucky to have a, a, a Washington internship and in Senator Russell's program, uh, I reported for my internship and I was assigned to be an elevator operator in the Senate office building. <laughs> and <clears throat> my career got off to uh, kind of a rough start. The, the first hour that I was on the job, People were getting on my elevator and I recognized Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. And my main job, my, the main duty of an elevator operator in the Senate office building is to recognize senators and to punch buttons on the elevator so that the elevator will go directly to the senator's floor. And when my elevator door opened on what I hoped would be the third floor where Senator Humphrey wanted to go, Unfortunately, we were not at the third floor. We were in the sub-basement by the boiler. <laughs> I thought my public service career had come to an end right then. And Senator Humphrey said something that's almost exactly this. It takes a while to master these machines, doesn't it? He had a, <laughs> he had a little bit of a smile. And that good-natured response in my little crisis really did helped to convince me of something that I still believe. And that is that most people who put themselves in the political arena are likable, decent people who really do want to do what they think represents the public interest. Now, a few years after my internship, I really thought I had been born under a lucky star when I got a call at the law school one day from the governor's uh, secretary, Governor Carl Sanders secretary, and she said that the governor wanted to talk to me about this law firm that he was going to open in a few months. It's been 45 years since that talk, and for those years, Governor Sanders has been my mentor, my law partner, my ally, and my great friend, and I really appreciate him being here tonight with some of my Troutman Sanders partners and colleagues, and they not only tolerated me participating in politics, but they encouraged me to mix politics in with my law practice. When Troutman Sanders got to be big, uh, we had policies for lots of things, and the policy that applied to me was that I could participate in politics and do public service projects, so long as uh, I satisfied two conditions. I had to keep my billable hours up, and 
I, I had to not make really dumb statements that would get in the newspaper. <clears throat> and there were several times I had to ask for a pardon from violating <laughs> both of those. Forty years ago, I took some time out to campaign for an Emory lawyer, 33 years old, who was running for the United States Senate. Did you get here, Senator Nunn? Are you here? <clears throat> well, I don't, I check because I don't like to poke fun at people to, if they're not present, but uh, <clears throat> I was one of these volunteer, amateur staff people when 33-year-old Emory lawyer Sam Dunn decided to run for the Senate. The most inspired thing that our team of amateur campaign volunteers produced for our candidate was a jingle. From time to time, uh, now, as Senator Nunn has grown into this international statesman, those of us who worked back then in the, in the uh, group that produced the jingle, we like to recite the jingle just to keep him humble and grounded. <laughs> And because the jingle is etched in our brains, and we think it's only fair that it stay etched in his brain. <laughs> so just imagine there's music in the background, and this was the jingle. Sam Nunn is tough. Sam Nunn is young. Put Sam Nunn in Washington. <laughs> None of us um, ever became poet laureates. <laughs> but the, the subject of that jingle has done serious public service. And Sam, we really appreciate you and Carlene being here tonight. Congressman Buddy Darden, uh, in his first campaign, we couldn't afford a jingle. <clears throat> but, but he got elected anyway because he memorized the name of every man, woman, and child in his congressional district. <laughs> so, buddy, we appreciate your being here. When I had been on the Court of Appeals a short, for my short stint, I told my wife, Linda, that I was inclined to leave the bench to participate in a campaign in which I would be the candidate. She said, fine, but there's a pattern developing here Every time you get a regular job, you quit to go run for something or, or help somebody. My explanation was then, and it's the same today, that there are lots of ways to be involved in public service, but one of the most thrilling, treacherous, rewarding, uplifting, and disappointing is the rough and tumble of politics. A fair question for law students that we might be asked is, can I both practice law and participate in politics? Well, fewer and fewer people are doing that. When Governor Sanders was in office, a majority of the legislature were lawyers, many of them top tier lawyers in their communities. One of the leaders in the state Senate in those years was Senator Ben Johnson, the dean of the Emory Law School. Lawyers, uh, fortunately, we still have a lot of good lawyers in the legislature and all across the government, but their numbers are going way down. Lawyers in politics used to make good stump speeches about cases that they had been involved in and won in court. But if you go to work for a law firm today, you might become an expert on electronic discovery. It's an important issue, but it's hard to make a stump speech out of that. <laughs> But the legacy of people like Ben Johnson is too strong to say that it's no longer possible to have a legal career mixed with politics. Your generation will have to make a creative effort to do it, but it's an effort worth making for this reason. Politics will always be rough and tumble, but there are times when people who are public officials, elected officials, with some vision and political backbone can make a difference, and they do. When that happens, 
it can be tremendously rewarding to have had a supporting role in that. Governor Zell Miller had that kind of opportunity in the 90s with an unusually large number of judicial vacancies to fill by appointment. <clears throat> it took a lot of backbone for Governor Miller to pass his friends, to bypass those people that he knew so well and who had eagerly awaiting to their turn to get appointed to the, to the bench, and to make appointments for men and women that he did not know, but who would make the judicial system more inclusive and diverse so that it could have the respect and confidence of the people it serves. Governor Miller did that, and virtually all the judges he appointed were reelected by the people. Those of us involved in recommending, nominating potential judges had a supporting role, but the decisions, the political will, and the appointments were the governors, and that's where the credit belongs. The EPIC Awards Committee was very gracious to remember that chapter from our history and to recognize my supporting role in that with this award, and thank you. <clears throat> Behind the bench of the Court of Appeals on the marble, great huge piece of marble, many of you have been there, there's the motto of the Court of Appeals engraved and it says, upon the integrity, wisdom, and independence depend the free rights, sacred rights of free men and women. I always think of Norman Underwood when I see that word integrity. And when he was on the court, he certainly fulfilled those characteristics and he was on the Judicial Qualifications Commission, those are the kind of people he looked for with those. So he left us a great legacy. Thank you very much. And before I come to this last paragraph here, I do want to recognize Governor Sanders. Would you please stand so people see that you are here? Are there any other governors in the audience today? <laughs> See? All right. Well, thank you folks for your participation tonight. Thank you, Emory Law alumni who are on the Epic Advisory Board. Would you all stand that are here? I know you're here because you put money into this thing. And we thank you for your vigorous support of these Emory Law students. They are a shy group. Thank you, students of EPIC, for your inspiring commitment to the highest ideals of the profession and for creating this wonderful, wonderful evening. These students who are making a difference have already learned that in the wise words of my Swiss hairdresser, Kurt, it's the difference that makes the difference. Of course, he said it to me this afternoon, as you can tell, but in, <laughs> I don't normally look like this. He said it in French. And now, to close, I introduce this evening's co-chairs, whom you already know, Molly Palmer and Jamie Schickler. Molly is 3L, so she's looking for a job, and Jamie Schickler is 2L, who's looking for a summer internship. Ladies, come on up. Hello, I'm Jamie Schickler. And I am Molly Parmer. And as the Inspiration Awards co-chairs for this year, we would like to just take a minute to thank the following people who have truly made this event a memorable one. First and foremost, we would like to thank the honorees and the presenters, as well as our very comedic MC. <laughs> 
for joining us here tonight to celebrate the important accomplishments in the legal field. Thank you for your years of work improving the situation of those in need. And thank you for inspiring us to follow in your footsteps. And we'd also like to thank Dean Shapiro, the entire Emory faculty, the development office, in particular, Eric Blackwell, Pam Lee, Tim Hussey, Don Downing, among others, the entire staff and operations, the entire custodial staff, the EPIC advisory board members, the EPIC executive board members, and all student members. And we would especially like to thank and recognize the numerous students who volunteered to help put on this event, um, particularly our committee chairs. So Brian Kaufman, Lily Martin, and Laura Riviera on the solicitations committee, Ashley O'Neill and Amanda Seifman on the day of committee, and Joanna Smith and Alyssa Bascom on ticket sales committee. We appreciate all of you very much. In addition, we'd like to thank Masterpiece Events, Bada Bing, Nicole's Events, and Emory Catering for their generosity in donating catering services for this evening's reception. Additionally, we would like to take a moment to recognize the one person who has helped us every step along the way. From helping us with fundraising to coordinating logistics to designing the program, this person has been helpful for months and months. So we'd like to acknowledge our main advisor for this event, Ms. Sue McAvoy. Thank you. Sue, please join us on stage. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> And finally, we would like to thank every person who has made a contribution to fund summer grants through EPIC and has thereby helped Emory Law students engage in public interest work over the summer. We would especially like to thank the following people and organizations for donating an entire grant this year. Frank and Joan Alexander, Janet Hayes Davis Foundation, Goico and Bole PC in honor of Howard O. Hunter, Laura S. Huffman, Kilpatrick Townsend in Stockton, Kimberly L. Myers, Rogers and Hardin, and the Norman and Bettina Roberts Foundation. Additionally, we would like to thank our Dean's Circle sponsors, Sutherland, Aspel, and Brennan, and Troutman Sanders for their full support of two students, two full grants, supporting two students as they work in the public interest this summer. That deserves applause. <laughs> Thank you all for attending this year's event. As a result of your combined support, we are incredibly happy to announce that so far this year, we have raised over $135,000 to go towards summer EPIC grants. <laughs> but we're not finished, and we hope to raise more as the months go by. Last year, approximately 60 qualified students applied for an EPIC grant, and to support each of those deserving students would take $300,000. So please continue to encourage your friends and colleagues to donate to this important cause and to help support Emory Public Interest Law students. So thank you again so much for your contributions and for your commitment to the public interest, and we hope that you will join us for a reception uh, immediately outside of the auditorium in Hunter Atrium. So enjoy the evening and thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, just a quick second before you go outside to enjoy the snacks and drinks. Of course, the people who have been overlooked thus far are of course our two lovely chairs. So on behalf of everyone here, everyone who gets grants, and of course the EPIC Advisory Board and the Executive Board. We want to thank both of you ladies so much for your hard work. It's fabulous. You've both done a great job. Thank you.